Uh, I'm going to start by talking about our studio a little bit. Uh, the office is door de Mandrup. Uh, and uh, yes, I'll talk about who we are, how we work, uh, then a little bit about uh, the theme of the weekend, Heritage City, and then a few projects that we've been working on that I think fit into this theme in maybe a slightly different way than we've been discussing uh, so far. So who we are, uh, Dorte Mandrup is an office based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, uh, I'm an American, but it is a Danish office. Uh, it was founded by Dorte Mandrup 18 years ago. Uh, it is very much a Scandinavian office. It values equality and a sort of pragmatic sensitivity. Uh, we're 60 people now. It's grown rapidly in the last several years, and we are from about 10 different countries. So although it is very much uh, Scandinavian in ideology, uh, we're very international in terms of the personnel. And we work on a lot of different kinds of projects on many different scales. Uh, this is a project we're currently working on. It's 180,000 square meters of mixed use. Uh, it's being built in central Denmark. Uh, it's the best seller tower and village. When the tower is built, it'll be the tallest in northern Europe. Um, but we also work on the very small scale. Uh, this is a reading nook uh, at, outside a summer home in Denmark. And we work on all of these different kinds of projects because we're not prioritizing size or budget or um, site. Um, what we're interested in is quality clients that uh, provide opportunities to be ambitious and uh, opportunities where we can have sort of an artistic uh, say in the work. So some of the things we've worked on are education and workspace. This is the a global meeting center for IKEA in Malmö, Sweden. We also do a lot of mixed use. This is um, a project that's in Copenhagen. Uh, the bottom floor is a private tenant. It's a grocery store. The middle two levels are um, gymnasium and community center, and on the top is housing. And of course, adaptive reuse. This is sort of the topic we're coming back to repeatedly uh, this weekend, and it's something that we have quite a bit of experience in as well. This is a project, um, it is Valencia, it's a, a lawyers association kind of conference center, uh, but it's in a building that from the 19th century that was originally a dance hall and a ballroom. So how we work, uh, we're very hands-on, this is a photo from the office. Before we do anything, we observe, analyze, and research uh, we think it's really important to know what we're working with, how we're working, uh, before we get too deep into a design strategy. And prototyping is God. We, we test everything over and over and over again. And uh, we think it's really important in the design strategy not to get uh, direction too quickly, not to kind of say, this is, this is the project and follow one path. But even if we think we have a solution we try to push in other directions and then test it. And what we find is that we often discover things we wouldn't have otherwise. We move in a different direction. We find new innovative solutions that um, even if they don't go into that project may come into another project later on. So this is actually a, a photo from testing out the facade for the best seller tower, which you previously <laughs> saw a rendering of. Um, and we quite quickly working with the client started working with a grid, um, but these are all different variations that we not only drew, but built uh, into models, and I think in the end we had over 70 different models. And we work with all kinds of tools. So you saw the prototyping in the physical model, analog models, but also 3D simulation. And we use this sometimes in competitions to, to find form, but also in later phases this was a project with a very complicated facade. Uh, it's basically an egg shape. So each panel was unique, um, but needed to act in sort of a similar way. So this was a project where this kind of modeling was incredibly crucial. So that was sort of the warm up, the kind of story of the office. And now I'll get to the theme of the weekend, Heritage City, or how we can sort of insert architecturally into a context that is already imbued with layers and meaning. 
Um, and this is a complicated question, and we've seen some, some answers and some results of how you can work with this this weekend, and I'm looking forward to seeing more as we continue the conversation. Um, but one answer, and maybe the easiest or clearest answer, is preservation. And we just say, this is our heritage, this is important, let's keep it. And that's the attitude of UNESCO, or the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, UNESCO designates sites and buildings around the world and um, uh, protects them through international treaties. They protect these places. So when we think of UNESCO, we think of places like the Taj Mahal, something that is so singular and magnificent. And in a way, this is the kind of heritage that it's very hard to begin to imagine how you might interact with it. Closer to home in Denmark, this is Kronborg Castle. It's in Northern Zealand, uh, in Helsingør. It's from the 16th century. It's significant architecturally. It's also significant historically. It played a really critical role in the history of the relationship between Denmark and Sweden. And you all know it as the setting of Shakespeare's Hamlet. UNESCO also protects places like this. This is also in Denmark. It's a religious settlement, settlement sort of a utopian idea of the perfect settlement. Uh, from the 18th century. Um, but UNESCO also protects landscapes. Um, and the first kind of phrase of the abstract of this weekend, as we heard last night, is there's no zero point or tabula rasa in urbanization. And I would argue that the same can be said for any landscape. Um, although the layers of context may not be as visible, we have embedded meaning into these places and affected them in physical and physical ways, manipulation. So these are images from um, the ice fjord in Ililuset, Greenland. And I'm showing them because at Dortmundrup we've had a very unique opportunity to work within the context of many of these sites. Um, so I will talk a pro about a project that we've recently been working on in this site uh, at the end. But first, I'm going to talk about three projects that we have worked on at this UNESCO her uh, heritage site, which is the Wadden Sea. Um, the Wadden Sea is the largest unbroken system of intertidal mudflats in the world. Uh, it runs along the coast of Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, and it is a singular and very important ecosystem for uh, sea life and bird migrations. Um, and while it is singular, it's also quite diverse in terms of the landscape. Uh, includes marshes, uh, mussel beds, sand dunes, um, yeah, tidal streams. And you can see that for the most part, it's very flat. It's all about this horizon and the tide that is constantly moving in and out. So the, I will talk about three projects that we've worked on here. Uh, the first one is in Riba, Denmark, which is the top white circle that you see. The second one is Willemshafen, Germany, which is in the middle. And the third is uh, in Groningen, in the Netherlands. So we'll start with uh, the Wadden Sea Center in Riba, Denmark. Uh, this is a project that we won in competition in 2014. Uh, it was completed and opened to the public in January of last year, so 2017. Um, and what it is, is uh, it is a visitor center for the Wadden Sea. It was a visitor center before we worked on it, and it was a renovation and extension. So a little bit more about this landscape. At, at the Wadden Sea, it is very open. There are almost no trees. Um, and as I said, it's very important for migratory birds that are coming from the north in the Arctic and traveling south to Africa. And they actually stop here for six weeks every year in the fall, uh, and they feed, and then they take off in formation, and you get this phenomenon, the black sun, which is incredibly beautiful. It's also a place for kind of human tourism. You can go and harvest oysters there, but it should be said that it's a place that is, uh, you should go with a guide. It's not a totally safe place because it is so large and so flat that you can walk kilometers from the shore and the tide will come in and it will come in too quickly and you can get caught out at sea and people actually drown here um, every year. 
So the region is, um, it's important also in Denmark, it's, uh, this area is where the Reba is the oldest merchant city in Denmark. Uh, this is sort of the building heritage. This is a reconstruction of a building that was built there uh, during the Stone Age. Uh, and you can see that it is mud and wood walls and straw thatched roof. It was also an important area for the Vikings. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a Viking building. The Vikings would build up on small mounds. This was before they had dikes. So when the tide would come in, they would be built above the water. Because of the tide, the land was also very fertile. It is very fertile. Um, and so it's a, it was significant for its agricultural properties as well. And this is another historic building. This one is from the 16th century and actually an original building, not a reconstruction. And this is the building that we were given to renovate. Um, it was built in the 90s. It's a steel construction. It has a tile roof. It doesn't really relate to the landscape at all. Um, the only thing that it is doing is it's in this, uh, the layout of the, the buildings is referencing sort of these farm courtyards that they have in the region. Um, and so our task was to um, add on to this, uh, save as much as we thought we could, and uh, basically renew this place. So our strategy was basically to engulf part of the building, or a lot of the building. Yeah. <laughs> um, we ended up saving this part of the building and part of this let arm as well. Um, and then everything else that you see is new, and maybe you can see it better here. So what is red in red dotted lines is the things that were existing and that we maintained, and everything else we sort of built around it. So we wanted to maintain, again, this um, shape, this courtyard typology, uh, but then sort of merge it all together into a singular form. And so, in terms of working, again, working in iteration, we had the idea, we knew what the concept was in this case, and went through many versions of trying to find the right shape and form to move forward with. And this is the finished plan. Um, here is the existing building, and also part of this here. And keeping that building actually, uh, move that, uh, saved us a lot of money because a lot of the installations, the cafe, the bathrooms, were already in that building. So by maintaining them and keeping them, uh, we didn't have to install all that stuff. The new installation uh, exhibit is through this part. It has a set path. You walk through in a sort of narrative form and out. Um, this is the former education building. Uh, which is now used for offices, and this is a brand new uh, education building uh, on the site. And this is a photo of the, the um, competition model, and this is the finished building. Um, and you can see that formal, formally, we really worked with this idea of the horizon line. We wanted the building to emerge somehow out of the landscape or feel like it fit very closely into the landscape. Um, you can see that we're working with the thatch straw material, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but here I think it's just important to note how it reflects the light um, and really kind of adds to the character of the area. So this is the entrance. Um, we're shaping the building with these kind of horizontal lines, again referencing the horizon, but also using it as a way to mark the entrance and to create um, some kind of shelter as you enter. It's another view of the entrance. This is a view from the courtyard. So the cladding is um, this straw thatch on all the new buildings. And we used Rabinia wood for as sort of a signifier of where the existing buildings are. So where we have the existing buildings, we're wrapping it and sort of adding these kind of formal lines so that it feels cohesive uh, with the rest of the building. But you can actually ha see that there's a trace of um, where the existing building had been. Uh, the courtyard landscape 
uh, is designed by Marianne Levinson, a Danish landscape architect, and it's in reference to the Arctic uh, landscape where the birds are migrating from. And this is another view of the existing building and how we treated it, wrapping it with uh, this rubinia, which is a very hard, uh, uh, durable wood, but it's a, quite a small tree, so you have to always work with these small um, members. One thing we did here was bring the roof line down or attempt to bring the roof line down. So, in, oops. so instead of it sitting up here, kind of pulling that facade down, um, which is actually much more traditional for uh, Danish farmhouses and also fitting into the new building. And then I have some views from the interior. This is um, the laboratory. One thing that was important in designing these interior spaces was that they all had a connection to the outside. Uh, the light had to be very controlled because it is an exhibition space, um, but we did many things to allow for light, whether in the skylight or in this room, you actually have access directly to the courtyard. Um, here's another skylight, and there you have a low light along the edge. Uh, we worked with the exhibition designer Jacques Studios, uh, also based in Copenhagen, uh, and had a very sort of fruitful relationship and conversation so that um, the exhibition felt very much at home in the architecture. Uh, we're actually working with them again uh, on the last project I'll show, the Ice Field Center. Um, but you can see that the exhibition itself is about the migratory birds, or here is a tank where you actually can touch the different sea creatures. So the facades, I, I mentioned a little bit about the, the wood facade on the existing building, um, but for the rest of the building, the new parts of the building, we used um, a thatched roof uh, straw. And as you saw from the kind of building, con uh, the building history in the area, this is very traditional in the area, and there are still several companies that do this around Denmark. They're all very small and family-owned. They're not, uh, the demand isn't high enough, <laughs> let's say, um, but we, uh, we were able to uh, work with one of these families and uh, really, really had a, a successful relationship in getting what we wanted. So it's also quite sustainable in that uh, the straw, the reeds are harvested right around the corner, essentially, in a fjord nearby. So they're very local. And then they're bundled. And this technique hasn't changed really at all uh, since forever. The, the Vikings. So these are bundled and then attached to the roof. Um, and one misconception about thatching is that it's actually cut to fit the right shape. But actually, it's, um, it's put on the roof whole. You can't cut it into smaller pieces because it'll, it'll lose its kind of property. It'll start to channel water through it. Uh, but you, you always use it whole. You put it on the roof, and then they use these big wooden boards to basically ram it into place. And then they do some very minor trimming at the end. But the shape you get is actually a result of this kind of ramming and not from actually um, cutting. So although it's quite formal and it looks as though you know, it could have been a singular block uh, just sort of shaved away, it's actually um, built to be exactly this shape and uh, rammed into place. And you can see here although it's quite hard to see, uh, the section and how thick the, the um, straw actually is. I think that's the end of the, the first Wadden Sea project. The second Wadden Sea project is the trilateral Wadden Sea Center in Wilhelmshaven, um, Germany. And uh, it's a quite different project in terms of its program. It's actually offices uh, that house organizations that promote and preserve the Wadden Sea. And it's trilateral because of the three countries, Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands. And uh, the site is also quite different. Um, what you see here is our site, which is this green triangle. And actually, the Wadden Sea is out here. And all of this is harbor. So what you should know about Wilhelmshaven is that it was founded by Kaiser Wilhelm before World War I. And its history is completely military. It's the largest natural harbor in, in Germany. Um, and during World War II, it was used to house the submarines. So 
submarines would stay in this area um, right next to our site, and the barracks for the people who worked on the submarines was on the site. Also on the site are two, or were two, large bunkers as a safety precaution for the workers there. Um, there were two. There is now only this one. Uh, they demolished one of them, and it was so difficult and expensive that they decided, forget it, we're just gonna, we're just gonna keep this one. <laughs> it's, you'll see in the sections, the walls are just so thick, um, you can't penetrate it. It's just so expensive. So this is sort of the anchor point on the site. This is sort of our, uh, our, our um, yeah, it's really the only anchor point on the site. The rest of the site right now is green and open. Um, it has a path along the water here. It will stay a park, and actually part of the competition uh, was to propose something about how the park might be used. And here you can see just the relationship of the bunker to, this, to the water beyond. But again, this is the harbor that you see beyond. The Wadden Sea is further out. So as you approach the site, the, the city is actually coming from this direction. So you'd approach the site and you can look out to the water and the bunker. And in sort of deciding how to place our building, we really wanted to preserve this view. So we didn't want to block the view of the water. Uh, this small arrow here, this is pointing to the ruin of a, an old church, uh, which is also of some interest in the area. Um, and as I said, we, we used the bunker as a anchor point in the site. We decided, uh, I mean, one option was to just leave it or somehow compositionally relate to it. And uh, what we decided to do was to completely engage it and build on top of it. Uh, by building on top of it, we also get high enough that you get views beyond the immediate water and to the actual Wadden Sea. Um, so you can see this is sort of the final diagram of the building in context. So we, we build on top and then sort of um, wrap the entire thing in a glass facade. So here's the site again. The city is here traveling this way. And when you reach the site, you can see past the bunker and our project, but you also see it and then uh, yeah, connects to the park itself. That's the idea, the, the bunker, layers of floors wrapped with this glass facade. And so here's uh, one of the elevations that we did. Uh, we are cantilevering out from the bunker. Uh, our building footprint is wider than the bunker itself. So we're actually cantilevering on two sides. And on the other two sides, we're using, on the sides of the bunker are the two concrete entrances. So we're using this actually as the base for the structure to hold the building up, um, the foundation of it all. And you can see here, the facade at the lower levels is very transparent. It's single layer glass at the lower levels. It's not conditioned. Uh, it's sort of a semi-public space. Uh, and that's to preserve the kind of view of the bunker itself. Uh, and then you enter through that, this black mass that you see going up is the main entry into the building. The glass above around the offices is uh, a sort of a milky uh, color and in part to um, provide some solar shading. So here's a, a rendering and you can see the landscape that we proposed ha was referencing to the Wadden Sea itself and these kind of pools of water, uh, tide pools. And you, here you can see it's the same as the elevation, the uh, stairs mass going up into the building. And there's a better view of the landscape with these pools of water and in relation to the water beyond, lit up at night. So I'll quickly talk about the plans just so you have an idea of what's actually going on in here. Um, this is the ground floor level, so it would be the entrance on the sides. And uh, that gray poche you see square, that's the bunker. So those, that's the thickness of the walls. Uh, it's extreme. And uh, we initially had a lot of conversations about could we actually use it in some way, get into it in a more profound way. We're using it here for storage and technical. Um, but it's the, the roof of it is actually the thickest part. So it's, it's, I mean, the budget of the project is just gone as soon as you try to 
try to work within it. So when you get up to the office levels, uh, actually the first level is um, primarily auditoriums and conference spaces. Uh, we have a courtyard in the center and part of the idea is that this is a semi-public space uh, that the public could come up and use this courtyard. As you go further up, you have a lot of offices. Uh, and then the courtyard also allows us to ring uh, the inner, uh, yeah, to ring the courtyard to allow natural light into those offices. And then at the top level, this is also meant to be a public space. It has actually only offices on these two sides. And this is left open. And that's the side that's facing the Wadden Sea. So as a member of the public, you can go up and get a view out and sit here. Uh, there's also a talk that if they wanted to expand, they could <laughs> then use that area. And there's the section, uh, and there's the roof of the bunker. <laughs> Just sort of impresses me every time. Um, yeah, and one last view of in that courtyard bringing some green inside. Okay, the last Wadden Sea project is the Wadden Sea World Heritage Center in Groningen. Um, and I should say the previous project is a competition that we won earlier this year. It's in the very early phases. Uh, this is also a competition we won earlier this year. Um, so we've had a lot of luck with the Wadden Sea. Um, this is in Groningen, or outside of Groningen, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, this is quite a large project. It's 9,000 square meters of mixed use. Uh, it has um, a hotel as well as exhibition and research spaces. And uh, it's located in a more similar way uh, to the first project in that it's directly on the sea. Uh, but it also has uh, the Lauersmeer National Park on the other side of it. So it's at this kind of critical point. Uh, there's no front or back to this building uh, because it has views to water on all sides um, and uh, is a quite beautiful natural area. Uh, but you can see also the kind of agriculture kind of seeping in on the sides. And again, it's about horizon and light. It's about this horizontal line and the changing of the light with the tide and the day. So here's a closer view. If you can see it, that white triangle there is our site. Um, and you have the Wadden Sea on the top and the Lauer Smear below it, the bottom of the image. And it actually does, the site actually does sit inside this harbor. Um, so it's a bit more industrial uh, than the first project, the first site that I showed you. Uh, here's the site plan with our project. And what you can see here is that um, this is a dike. So this is a raised uh, road running past it here. Um, and this is where people would be coming from. P the parking actually exists already and is over here. Um, so people would be coming from the road uh, to visit the site itself. So in working on this, uh, this is the site. Uh, this, that's that road again. North is in this direction. <laughs> um, but one thing we noticed was uh, the kind of barriers. Uh, the dike is lifted above, the, ro the road is on the dike, which is lifted above the site itself, and the site itself is lifted above the water. Everything seems to be disconnected. So one of the first things that we did was work with this, the land, the site itself, um, and creating this artificial plinth. So lifting up the front edge of it to meet the road and pushing down into the water uh, to allow the tide to actually come up onto the plinth um, and roll in and out. So creating this con connectivity between the land and the sea. And uh, one of the one of the important parts of the brief for this project was sustainability. And one aspect of sustainability that they touched on, which we don't talk about very often, is the idea of social sustainability. Um, what they really didn't want was this to be a tourist destination with no local interaction. So they talked about having kind of stalls for farmers markets um, and also creating this very public open space. So we used this plinth 
as a way to um, uh, activate the space. And we're, again, actually working with our landscape architect Marianne Levinson uh, to work on the, the kind of, ooh, how we work with the, the cutting of the plinth or creating different kind of ways of interacting with the water, tidal pools, um, benches. You can see here that it's, it becomes quite an interactive landscape where the tide, at one time of day, there's a bench, and later in the day, maybe there's no bench because the tide has come up and over it. The tide is changing up to four meters every day. Um, and again, the lifting up, this seems to be a theme with some of these projects, lifting up to get the view. Um, if you can get higher than the dike, you have a view in all directions, 360 degrees, uh, and that became really quite important to us so we actually used sort of a maritime reference in putting the building on piles, like you see on piers. Um, and uh, so it sits on these piles, and the water can flow underneath it, and the building is up above. Uh, a little bit about the program I mentioned briefly. It's mixed use. Uh, there's a large reception area that is also meant to be sort of, again, interactive with the public. The experience exhibition space uh, there is also a science and research center where um, students will come and spend six months of the year actually doing hands-on research. Also an integral part of this uh, Wadden Sea Center is the seal center. So there are many seals that live in the Wadden Sea and they often get abandoned or injured on the beach due to boating. Um, and so the seal center actually takes in the animals and rescues them and rehabilitates them, and then releases them back into the water. Um, and then a hotel, restaurant, uh, offices, conference, et cetera. Um, and so the thing about the science and the SEAL Center is that although they're private and need uh, privacy, and um, yeah, they need to be separate, uh, they, also, uh, they also want some kind of an interaction. They want these to be a part of that program to be visible to the visitors so that they can actually see what's happening and this is real research. So our concept for sort of how we were working with this was a kind of a spiral flow that you actually move your way up through the building, you start in the reception, through the experience and past these other things and end up at the restaurant and the hotel at the top. So this sort of diagrammatic series uh, entering the building from the plinth and moving up. And what this also allows by the kind of circular movement is that you're always getting a different view out the window. You're always looking to the Lower Smear or you're looking to the Wadden Sea or you're looking towards the harbor. Um, so you move up and finally reach the roof. And on the roof is actually incorporated some of the seal pools where they are re rehabilitating the animals. So this is one of the final renderings, and you can see the water rising up on the plinth, the idea that there are these cutouts where people can play and interact, um, the building itself with an entrance, and the, the marina beyond. I should say also that there is some program in the plinth as well, and I guess you can see here in the section uh, there is a rescue uh, boat here for actually um, emergencies on the water in this area. So they're located in the, in the plinth as well as the marina services. We've talked about parking uh, and that may or may, or may not happen. Um, but you can see here in the section the kind of relationship of the different spaces and this idea of layering. Uh, this is a view of the entrance coming off of the plinth. You can see on the bottom right hand side the water below and the piles. And then this is a plan. So again, on the, this is the entrance here. You come up this ramp and into the main uh, reception area that has a cafe, uh, business meeting space, uh, bathrooms, um, retail. And then moving up, these are quite difficult to read even when they're very crisp because there's a lot going on. <laughs> Um, but you move up into the experience space, and up here we also have conference um, area facing out to the water. On the upper levels are the hotel rooms, and up here all of these squares are all of the different pools for the seals. So they are, there are three different phases. It's very 
complicated in terms of the layout and how they work in terms of sanitation um, and, uh, yeah, movement. And then finally, the roof, which is a big open space with views out. The kind of luxury hotel apartments actually sit up here and have uh, little outdoor areas where they look out. And then the squares, again, are actually the pools. So you can see the seal pools from inside, through, the, through glass, or from above. Another view of the building. And I mentioned the horizontality again, the horizon. And that was part of what we worked with when we worked with um, designing this and using these kind of flat, creating these sort of flat plates that, that then are being folded. Um, and the idea of that is that they relate to this very flat horizon. And working with the facade, uh, it's a very glass facade. We wanted to get these views out. Um, so we're working with sort of a lamella system uh, with different uh, widths between them depending on the side. And also, uh, as we have these, maybe it's easier to see here, the decks, the floor plates themselves, stick out at different levels. So they can stick out further on the south side to create greater shade um, and then have a narrower um, protrusion on other sides. This is another view from, from the water, an active space, lifted up high enough that you can see under it. It doesn't become a horribly dark space. It can be used as a beacon or not. They actually have in this area, um, uh, it's called Dark Sky, I think. I can't remember the exact name. But it, they have protected uh, sky, dark sky, basically to, to avoid light pollution. So this was something that was also in the brief. Uh, so to show what this could be, how, we could, how you could actually um, just make it as dark as possible. And one last view uh, from the harbor. OK, so that was the three Wadden Sea projects. And this is my last project. It's the Ice Fjord Center in Ililiset, uh, Greenland. Um, and Ililiset is on the west coast of Greenland. Uh, it's the second largest city in Greenland with, with 4,500 people uh, and 3,500 sled dogs. Uh, <laughs> it's located. The city itself is this part, uh, and the ice fjord is down here, this whole thing. And actually, this is our site. Um, this is a really uh, important region uh, in terms of civilization. It's been inhabited for 2,000 years, and this has everything to do with the ice fjord. Uh, the ice fjord brings nutrients from the ice cap, and actually as it moves through the fjord, and actually at the end of the fjord, there's a ridge in the ground that kind of um, breaks up the ice and actually spreads the nutrients into the water. So it's incredibly nutrient rich. There's a lot of animal life, large mammal animal life, whales in the area, uh, and that also brought human settle settlement here quite early. Uh, the ice fjord itself, which is here, it's that white stripe uh, there in this red landscape. Um, it is the most active and fastest, sorry, not the ice fjord, but the, the glacier calving is the, is the most active glacier outside of Antar Antarctica. Um, and the ice fjord moves quite quickly. And it's one of the only places where the ice cap goes out and reaches the sea. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's incredibly uh, picturesque. And a little bit about, uh, I don't know what the landscape two is. <laughs> there. Uh, a little bit about the building in the area. Um, there are no building materials in Greenland. They don't have any trees. They have rocks. You can, they can build in rocks. But actually, uh, a lot of their building tradition stems from actually bringing wood from northern Europe. So they traditionally build in wood, uh, and they build on top of rocks so that when the snow melts, it melts away from them. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, wood is a very kind of sacred thing here. I mean, when driftwood appears on the shore, it's like a very treasured item, uh, which is, is, I think, a very foreign idea to a lot of us. It's also a very foreign culture just because of where it's located. It's 250 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it snows from September to mid-May. And uh, in the summer, it's light all day. On November 30th, the sun goes down, and it doesn't come up until January 12th. So it's total darkness for over a month. And because of this kind of very unique climate, the plant life is, is uh, well, it's very delicate. Um, it, everything grows very slowly. So what you see here, this kind of moss growing over the rocks, if, if we were to take this away, scrape it away, it would take 40 years uh, to replenish. So it's quite fragile. Um, this is our site. Uh, we're building the competition. Uh, it, it was a competition in 2000 that we won in 2016. Uh, we are starting building this summer, and it will be finished in 2020. Um, the, the building itself is uh, the Ice Fjord Center, so it's an information visitor center for people visiting the Ice Fjord. It's a very popular tourist site. The cruise ships come to Aluluset just for people to see uh, the Ice Fjord. It's also uh, sort of at the center of climate change conversations because this is where we have, for years, we can track how things have been changing. Uh, the glacier itself is retreating rapidly um, up the fjord. Um, this is the site. There's a small lake. It's quite rocky. Uh, but if you go, go out onto the rocks and go quite far out, lean out, you actually get this amazing view directly to the ice fjord. So when we were designing the building, uh, we knew we wanted to build on the rocks to avoid kind of trampling as much of the flora as possible, um, but also to reach out over this lake to get this view from the actual center. Um, so this is a small diagram also showing how the building, which is this kind of C shape, which we literally is a sort of a linear form that just kind of bends out over the lake, but how this also works with uh, snow uh, buildup and trying to reduce uh, the snow drift uh, is to as small as possible. And Again, lifting the building away from the landscape, so it's sort of hovering over this landscape. Uh, it's another project that is actually up on um, columns. So the shape of the building is this C, but it's also kind of uh, twisted. So what we've done is sort of pushed uh, the two corners down on each side, so it allows for, on the top part of the diagram, it allows for movement through and views out across the lake and also to the ice fjord, but also from the exterior to walk up onto the roof and over it and uh, along the UNESCO World Heritage Trail, which begins at this site. Uh, this is the concept of the pieces. So the roof is very important as it's accessible. Uh, these series of frames that form the structure and lead you through the building. The floor plan is as open as possible. I'll show it a little later but it has these sort of um, organic shaped spaces uh, that you move and kind of slide around uh, for the kind of enclosed private spaces and then the, the kind of foundation with the columns. Uh, this is the site plan. So you arrive by car or bus here. We've redesigned, this used to be a heliport which we're taking away and putting a new car park uh, and then walk down to the uh, the building itself, the entrance is here. Uh, this is the World Heritage Trail. So you can see that it connects. You can walk up and over the building uh, like so. And this is a, a rendering uh, from the competition. Uh, and you see how the building is actually bent, folding down to allow access up onto it. What you also see in this image is that at both ends, so here and there, uh, we've preserved a quite large, open, but sheltered space for gatherings of large groups. Um, 
and uh, for protection from the wind. Um, so the building, the enclosed part of the building is 900 square meters, but actually the total kind of uh, footprint is 1,800, so it's twice as big with the exterior spaces. Uh, a rendering from, uh, from kind of the rock looking, looking straight at the building. So you can see on the left how you go up over the building, enter the roof, uh, and I think it's quite nice here at the center where you can see that it's actually lifted up off of the ground. It's got this kind of hovering uh, feeling. And then an elevation. Again, an elevation from the other side. It's sort of the other side of this rendering where you can see that it sits on the rock in some places, but other places it lifts up. So there's this kind of gentle floating uh, motion. A uh, uh, winter view, quite stunning place, all, all times of the year. And sort of the summer. So this bending of the form to create this roof terrace also creates a quite interesting experience, spatial experience on the interior. As you move through the building, it's constantly changing. Uh, you never have the same uh, shape walls around you. So when you enter the building, it's a triangle, and it slowly shifts. Uh, this is in the entrance area to almost a perfect square in the exhibition, and then folding back around in the other direction until you get to a triangle at the other side. Uh, this is the plan. Uh, you enter from this end, go through this shape, this is the uh, sort of entrance hall with a cafe, and then the main exhibition space is here. Uh, there's some private offices uh, inside of this volume. So another look inside. And this would be inside the exhibition space. I mentioned earlier that uh, this exhibition is also being designed by Jacques Studios, who worked on the Wadden Sea Center with us in Riba. And I think that's it. Thank you. Let's say Northern experience and a very different approach. Uh, uh, comparing with the, with the other guests and with other speakers that we had the opportunity to to hear here on the on the stage, uh, I would stress that uh, uh, Dorte Mandrup Studio is uh, coming to Banja Luka more or less directly from the Venice Biennale, yes. where you had uh, where you were invited to 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 present. Uh, like a, a kind of installation, which really reminds on the on the last uh, project. Yeah. So my question is, uh, and the theme of the of the Biennale is uh, freedom, space of freedom. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested uh, in how much the freedom is actually the part of the of the heritage in that uh, Danish context as we know that is part maybe of the mentality of the people of Denmark or <laughs> or in generally in the in the in the northern Europe. Yeah. Do I need that? Yeah. yeah, the so we were just at the Biennale and I was fortunate enough to also be there uh, with Dorda and a few others from the office. And we showed uh, our exhibition uh, was um, having to do with the last project I showed, the Ice Fjord Center. Um, and basically what we did, I don't, maybe you've seen images or you can look it up, but what we did is we made a very abstract version of the model in, in space. And, but the main thing was we created a room that tried to replicate the conditions of this site. So it is a sound and a light installation uh, and also a very ex extreme and expensive <laughs> Um, installation of curving the space, kind of completely transforming this room into an endless Arctic landscape. Um, and I think at least 
in terms of our approach there, I mean, the free space had a lot to do with the idea of these landscapes. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite complicated, though, because in this context, you know, you, we talk about it as a World Heritage Site that is very much uh, complicated and extremely charged. Like, it's already been decided that this is too important to touch. And I should say that none of our projects are directly on the World Heritage Sites. They're all adjacent. Uh, the the uh, Ice Fjord Center is in a kind of a buffer zone where the, you can't really build, but we receive special permission. Um, so it's complicated because it is sort of a free space in a way. We're building a lot in these very open areas, but it's also about the context and understanding what's important or what is good in these places um, and how you deal with the, the history and the meaning and, you know, the value of the place. I would have so many follow-up follow questions, but uh, I have my guest also here, Milana Stiak, uh, which is, uh, who, who has some uh, question prepared. So, Milana, please. Thank you, Igor. Uh, so, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. We are very glad to have someone from Denmark, and uh, we are more glad because it's a lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have more uh, men in architecture than uh, women, that's fine. So, uh, the world's heritage is something that belongs to all of us. And today we create new layer of uh, heritage. We create very new heritage. And we can mix uh, all cultures in architecture. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, heritage is space without borders? This is also related with the free space, no? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I want to say yes, that I do think that it is heritage. I mean, people feel it differently, right? I guess you feel closer to a heritage of maybe a place that you spend more time or that you grew up. But uh, I mean, especially when you look at landscapes, which is what I talked about in terms of heritage, it's, uh, it's very hard to separate it from or to kind of attach it to any one kind of group of people. I mean, who does it belong to? And, um, it's also complicated in terms of architecture because uh, we're a Danish office working in other places. And so if you're doing a renovation building, uh, you're from Denmark and you're renovating a building in Banja Luka. And so then, you know, whose heritage is it? Are you allowed to touch that as a foreign architect? And I think, I think part of the answer is yes. I mean, you have to, you have to be careful of context. You have to know... Uh, you have to know what you're working with and talk to people and understand. But I, I do think it's sort of global. I think that, especially with the global community, the way that the way that the world operates now, it's very much an, an it's very much an open world. And I think we should kind of it should be allowed to be shared by everyone. I know that we were speaking yesterday that uh, uh, we will have more prepared questions. Do we have them now? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is opportunity to, to make Sonia suffer more on this stage. Uh, Gonzalo? Yes, yes, <laughs> Please. It's very impressive. Uh, you are working in those uh, places. Uh, it's quite different from uh, other uh, intervention in heritage, because uh, usually we, we could think uh, if intervention in heritage is intervention in building construction, and your, your intervention is in landscape. Uh, it's really... Uh, difference, it's a great difference, the intervention in landscape or in building uh, construction in terms of heritage? Is it, is it a great difference? Yes. Uh, y yes what and do no. You think about I, it? I would say that, uh, I mean, it's all context, right? It's all, you have to do the same work, right? You have to understand what's important and what, what's of value and what you keep. Uh, I think it's maybe 
each project is very different, but uh, the division between, at least at our office, I think the division between intervening on a very kind of critical landscape or onto a building, uh, the, the process is sort of the same. The, actual, the mindset, and maybe, maybe the work itself is different, but the mindset of how you deal with it is quite similar in, in that, yeah, you have to understand it. You have to make, and you have to make value judgments. You know, there's, there's nobody that can say yes or no, this is important or not. And we do have governing bodies like UNESCO that says these things, and then you have to follow it. But a lot of the time you're working in a context on a site or in an existing building where you're making value judgments. And uh, so you have to do the work and sort of uh, just know what you're working within. But to the, to the difference between landscape and uh, building, I think it's, I mean, it's all your site, right? Whatever it is, it's your site, it's your context. And so I think the approach is actually quite, can be quite similar. Thanks. Is there any more question from the audience? I still have the tickets for the for the fair in Klagenfurt <laughs> to present to someone. Maybe Marina or Malina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have more. Igor and I have more, more and more questions. So. Um, <laughs> Can we connect uh, social sustainability and heritage? Is heritage how we use open space, actually, one culture, how, how use it? So you showed something in your presentation related to this. Yeah. Yeah, I think generally, of course, uh, social and heritage, there's a connection between social qualities and heritage. And in fact, when UNESCO designates projects, sites, buildings as important as UNESCO sites, uh, it doesn't have to be because the architecture is amazing. It can be historical or social. Um, so I think, uh, but how that relates to architecture is maybe a little bit less clear, kind of the, the triangles between social issues heritage and architecture. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's there. I just, I, it's hard to define, I guess. <laughs> okay, then um, I would uh, like to thanks again to, to, to Sonia, to Dorte Mandrup Studio for coming here, to, for, for, for being with us, for participating. And uh, I hope we will uh, see you again and uh, host you again. And uh, yeah, thank you once more. Thanks. <laughs>